New material is what any major band is about. And I caught up with King down in Hastings, working hard in the sun. In fact, the schedule since the Hammersmith gig hasn't left much room for relaxing. Directly after finishing the tour, the next day we flew off to Germany <laughs> to do TV over there, which was quite good fun. Actually, it was quite outrageous. Never got on stage till three in the morning or something like that. It was like a sort of Montreux type affair. Uh, from there, I actually went to Paris to do a radio thing with Janice. Janice Long for Radio 1. And then we went down to uh, the south of France to check out a, a possible King uh, concept <laughs> for later on. Um, we've done the Pink Pop Festival in Holland, which was like our first major open air festival that we've ever done. From there, we then went, of course, to, to Greece to do some promotional work in Greece because King are, are taking off in Greece. And um, also, we filmed the, the video for our next single, and then without you, while we were there, took the opportunity to do that. Mickey, you've been entertaining us with some piano playing in the hotel bar. Yeah. Are you classically trained? Yeah, from really, really little. I had lessons for years and years, you know, with various teachers and that. That's, uh, it's been invaluable now, you know, it's all paying off. Was the pressure on you to give up piano and go into the world of pop, or was it the other way around? Well, I don't, I don't think it's a question of giving up anything to go into anything else. I mean, music is music, you know, really. So, um, I think a classical training basically in anything is, is good, you know. <clears throat> I mean, technique-wise and stuff like that. Not that that's desperately important in, in modern music, but um, it, it all helps, you know, an awareness of harmony and stuff like that. When you go back home to your friends and family, uh, find it easy to relate to the fact that you're now famous? Now famous? Wow, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't suppose it's really dawned on us yet. Well, certainly on me yet, yeah, certainly. Um, I, I don't think anything's changed, really. I mean, um, a few more people come up to you in the street and say hello, you know. Um, and that's about it. It's nice, you know. It hasn't gone totally over the top at all. What about your hometown, Coventry, and your folks and family and friends and things? How have they coped with your own personal success? Uh, very well. I think they, they're really enjoying it, mainly because it gives them, you know, something to talk about. Because my mother works at a factory, you know, uh, with a high percentage of women, and it gives her something to talk about. And uh, I think they just, you know, they're just proud, really, as most parents would be, I'm sure. How do you relax, then, yourself? Me? Um, well, in Coventry, when I'm at home, I actually wind down by going to Solarium and Fitness Centre with Fifi the massager. Um, <laughs> He sits on my back pretty regularly, doing my shoulders. Uh, Jimmy, okay. why are you so elusive when it comes to being filmed? Or so it appears, especially in the concert. Well, in the concert, I think I cut myself shaving pretty badly, you know, so I don't want to get too close, because it showed up. You know. You've also got quite a lot of work yeah, to do seriously. on the floor, haven't you? Yeah, there's a lot of effects that I use on the floor and at the back, towards the amplifiers and stuff, and uh, I think it's pretty hard work for him to actually catch me. You know. Is the guitar a passion? Or is it just an instrument of fortune? No, I, you know, I think like the old tennis racket in front of the mirror and stuff, I think it's like a, you know, it's, it is a passion to me, you know, I really enjoy sort of playing it. The actual tones you can get out of it, so it's more interesting than Oof. the other stuff. You know. What age were you when you picked up the guitar? Well, I had a little plastic Beatles one, I guess, when I was about 10. Two years ago, when I first heard of King, a picture came through the post of a dolphin and Doc Martin boots. Are you going to live that down? I think both those things simply were, we used the dolphin and the boots as a symbol of what King were about musically and spiritually. And I think uh, that they're still as prominent today and still as part of what we're about musically and as individuals as they ever were. It's not something they ever want to live down, it's what we were. And we're very proud of that. I think one of the things I'm pleased with King so far is that we stuck to what we believed in with ourselves and everything. You personally are a guy of quite a few talents, acting, singing, dancing. Um, washing up. Washing up yeah. as well. Arnie. <laughs> Probably driving past cars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is the main? Which is the which is main the stay? Main. Which is the main man? Um, I think I, since I was about 15, 16, started doing all the things I did, you know, clubs and all that sort of stuff and dressing up. I think essentially I've boiled it down now as I've sort of come through drama school and reached King and what I'm doing. that. It's all one thing, and that's just a performer. We're hearing a great sound, we're seeing a great live gig, yet the band and all its publicity material is still a four-piece. No drummer is part of King. Why? Well, when we actually started, um, we went through two, two sort of local drummers from Coventry, and we couldn't actually find anybody who, who actually matched musically the actual strengths of the other guys in the band. Um, and from that day onwards, 
we as a unit obviously got a lot closer and tighter and it, it develops into being a team and a family. And um, I think now we've reached a position where as, as a unit it would be very hard for an individual to come into it and fit in as part of that uh, and for us to accept him. For any band in the UK, it's still an ordeal, I think, to tackle London for the first time. Is it nerve-wracking? The, the strange thing about London concert I always find is that you obviously have a mixture of genuine fans who are there to see you and want to enjoy it and then you have all the media attention. So you have people who come to see concerts all the time on a critical level, as well as the business, of course, your own record company there taking up God knows how many seats. It's a different occasion. Um, I enjoy it for what it is on that level. It is difficult to believe that this city was completely flattened during World War II. It has since been rebuilt and witnessed one of the great music successes of the 70s, Two-Tone. This is Coventry. Sometime industrial boom town, sometime ghost town. This is the focal point of the city. Out of the ashes of the old cathedral, the magnificence of the new one. This symbol of new life, its mixture and meeting of style, symbolizes the philosophy behind Coventry's latest success, Multitone, and the band King. Paul King was born in Galway, but after just three months moved to Coventry, where he still lives. He attended Collardon Castle Comprehensive School, and he left there with five O-levels. On leaving school, Paul King got a job here at Rolls-Royce in Anstey, which is just outside Coventry. He spent a couple of years working here as a stores clerk. And I'm going to meet up with some of the people he worked with, Peter, Martin, Kay and Steve. Kay, what do you remember of Paul King? Uh, mainly green shoes with red laces. Uh, mainly short black hair and his ballet dances in the office, plus uh, his bass guitar and when he never had a good time. Yeah, I used to get on the works bus before him, so when the bus used to pull up at his stop, you get, I was sitting near the back, so all the heads would go out the window just to see what he was wearing that day, you know. Well, he was always in interested in music. He was either writing songs and, and it's, you know, strumming along on his guitar, imagine a guitar. He was obviously an individual. You'd spot him in a crowd quite easily, yeah. It was always you're going to do something else, so he went to drama school afterwards. But, you know, I don't know what it would be, but something better than in stock order, yeah. So Paul left a steady job to embark on a drama course, which could give him no guarantee of work at the end of it. I asked Bob Pryor Pitt, his tutor, what he thought Paul's reasons were for joining the school, and what he got out of it. One of the things he always wanted to do was be an actor. And during the time he was here, I think that perhaps we helped to open his mind into the possibilities of communication, the art of communication within the theatre. Shut your mouth, shower. You don't understand. I think you that um, once you've actually caught on with the idea that your body is a powerful tool of communication and you are in fact in control of it and you can do what you like with it, then of course you can start to be creative. Everything will be gone into. Everything will be brought into the open. And once you realise you've got to, you can actually get people to look at you and listen to you through body and voice, then you can start adding other things, costume to it, you can add lighting to it, you can add music to it, you can develop it in any way you want to, which I think is what Paul has tried to do. Paul left the drama school when a local ska band, the Reluctant Stereotypes, asked him to join them. They toured and had an appearance on Whistle Test. Paul then met up with a guy called Perry Haynes, who has become his manager. This was the beginning of the end for the stereotypes, but the birth of King. In order to earn money during this time, Paul got a part-time job as a singing monk. Yep, a monk. Here at Coombe Abbey, the manager, Lois Pargeter, explains. He used to come in here dressed as a monk and ask the guests to follow the monk at the tolling of the bell. And Paul's second speech would continue with the history of the Abbey from when the Cistercian monks arrived in 1150. And at the end of this speech, the customers would be taken by peasant names into the pool. Now this is the banqueting hall. And after the players have reenacted the dissolution, Paul would have entered dressed as a herald or a steward. Was that the only job he did? No, he was my daytime caretaker which involved collecting staff and various other jobs. A lot of his songs that he is doing today 
were all done, first of all, on that piano. King was now in full flight. Paul had been joined by Tony from the Reluctant Stereotypes and by Jim and Mickey from two of the numerous local bands. And they rehearsed here, in Jim's attic. Thanks to Jim's dad, who had a lot of patience, and also the old lady next door, who's a little bit hard of hearing, they were uninterrupted for about a year, which is enough time for them to get themselves all together and then hit Coventry and go and do the pub and club circuit. And they cut their teeth at the General Wolf and also here at the Dog and Trumpet, aided and abetted by Ken, Ken Brown, who booked them not once, not twice, but many times. Why so many times? What was so good about them? Well, and I knew Paul, Paul King, from uh, his earlier band, we looked at stereotypes. Um, obviously, he had a lot of talent then, and when he formed his new band, I went ahead and booked them again. Did they get a lot of good reaction from the audience? Oh, yeah, and the audience went wild, obviously, with excitement and that, of the live performance. And hard work is they knew what to go after. Uh, they realised that it wasn't... Uh, punching around, shall we say, in front of the cameras all the time. There was a lot of hard graft to be done before they actually got there. It was during this time that they signed to CBS Records. They obviously had a lot more gigging to do, a lot more rehearsals as well. But come January 85, they had their first hit single. The inevitable had happened. King had broken big.